to the last day of Eurocrypt. I hope you're all looking forward to the session today. Our first speaker is going to be Inba Kaslasi, and she's going to be talking to us about public coin statistical zero knowledge batch verification against malicious verifiers. Please welcome Inba. Okay, so everyone, um, this is a joint work with uh, Ron Rottenblum and uh, Prashant Vasudevan. So let's start. Okay, so interactive proof, um, P can convince uh, the verifier in the validity of uh, some statement. Um, However, let's suppose that we want to check that k different instances are, are valid, meaning to accept if they are all yes instances and to reject if at least one of them is a no instance. So the naive solution is just to run the protocol one time for uh, each instance. Um, so let's say that running the basic protocol for one instance takes m communication bits. So this solution will take us m times k, m times k communication bits. And the question is if uh, we can do better. We want to save communication uh, and the, the question of batch verification uh, in that sense, ask if we can do that better. So this um, question was uh, studied uh, before uh, uh, in different ways. Uh, however, none of uh, most of this work, uh, the, uh, the resulting protocol wasn't zero knowledge. Uh, and our focus on this talk is batch verification for statistical zero knowledge. So our basic question is suppose that some problem has a statistical zero knowledge uh, protocol. Um, can we verify that k different instances are all in zero are, are, are all yes instances in zero knowledge and without a trivial communication? Uh, it is a natural problem and it can also be used for a batch verification of signatures and public keys. Okay, so Excuse in me for interrupting, but we're not seeing your slides here. Are you sharing your screen? This one, all of them have extended screens. Yes, much more. Uh, okay, so yeah, um. So I just repeat, so our main question is suppose that some problem uh, is a statistical zero knowledge protocol. Can we verify that K different instances uh, are yes instances in zero knowledge and without uh, with non-trivial communication? So in a previous work um, with also with Ron and uh, Prashan and also with uh, Guy Rottenblum and Adam Silfon, we show that for every problem in NISK, which is a subclass of SDK, so it has an honest verifier SDK batch verification protocol with a non-trivial communication of K plus poly N. However, it was left open if uh, we can get protocol that is also public coin and even more significantly, a protocol that is also against malicious verifiers. Okay, so... In this work, we eliminate these two drawbacks and we show that every problem in NISDK has a public coin statistical zero knowledge batch verification protocol with communication of a K plus poly and same communication. Okay, so our uh, approach is to do that in two steps. First, we show a public coin honest verifier, honest verifier uh, batching protocol um uh, for this problem uh, 
And after this step, we could have used the known uh, transformation of uh, Goldreichstein and Vadhan that shows the transformation. Uh, the transformation is from public or honest verifier to public or uh, malicious verifier. However, this uh, transformation takes a, a communication overhead that we cannot afford. Um, and therefore, in our second step, we show a transformation. We modify this transformation to be with small communication overhead. Um, however, uh, for this uh, transformation to be applicable, we need some extra um, a feature that we refer to as nice. So in the first step, we show that uh, this protocol is also nice. Um, so the way we do the first step is by taking a problem that is NIVK hard, and we show um, uh, this protocol for this problem. So I won't have time to go over this a problem and it's batching protocol, but uh, I do have time to show you a much, much more simplified uh, version of it, uh, which is the, the permutations. So for this problem, the input is length preserving circuits. And uh, the yes cases are circuits that define a permutation where the no uh, cases are circuits that are far from being permutations in the sense that every image has at least two pre-images. So now we want to construct the honest verifier public coin batching for this problem. Uh, and the way we think about, uh, the way we think on a K different uh, circuits is as a composition of circuits. So the protocol would go, go as follows. First, um, V samples some YK, okay? And sends it to the prover. Then the prover uh, computes some X1 such that the composition of the circuit on this X1 equals uh, YK, sent to the verifier, the verifier uh, verifies it and accepts or rejects accordingly. So um, permutations are invertible. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have uh, completeness. For zero knowledge, we consider the verifier, the simulator that samples X1 and computes the composition of the circuits on this X1. And for the no cases, uh, we consider the last uh, no circuit. CI is the last no circuit. Um, since the circuit CI plus one to CK are all uh, yes, uh, instances and therefore permutations, uh, if the YK is uh, selected uniformly, then the YI is also selected uniformly, it's also distributed uniformly. Um, but let's take a closer look at the image of uh, the circuit CI. So the image size of CI is a no instance, therefore each image has at least, uh, has at least two pre-images and the image size is uh, at most two to the N minus one. And therefore the probability that uh, the YI will not be in the image of CI is at least half. And therefore we also have soundness. So um, yeah, so that was uh, the protocol for this problem. Uh, and we also have some uh, open problems uh, that we thought of, uh, batch verification for SDK um, poly logarithmic dependence on K, a uh, constant number of rounds uh, and an efficient prover. So yeah, that's all. Thank you. Okay, so I'm afraid we've actually gone a bit over time, so we don't have time for questions, um, but thank you very much.
Okay, our next talk is on efficient range proofs with transparent setup from bounded integer commitments, and the talk is going to be given by Michael Reitel. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, hello everyone. So, I'm going to talk about efficient range proofs with transparent setup from bounded integer commitments. And yeah, this joint work with Geoffrey Couture, Michael Close, and Wang Lin. So, first of all, let's dive right into the setting. So, we want to show essentially like, so the prover has access to some some uh, integer x and it's in the range a b and the verifier only has access to a committed version of this of this integer and uh, also the range a b and then he wants to be convinced by the prover that um, the prover actually knows the opening of the commitment so he knows x and also that x is in the range a b um, so there's numerous applications for this for example anonymous transactions where you want to show that you have enough money so you kind of need to show that your balance is not negative um, or, for example, anonymous credentials, where you want to show that you're old enough or your ticket is still valid. Um, yeah, depending on the representation, you can transform this into a range proof. So there's two main approaches. The first one being um, the, the square decomposition, uh, or like the first one being usually you use the binary decomposition, but I won't go into detail here because uh, we focus on the other approach, which is the four square decomposition. So in short, what you do is you have... Um, um, you have your integer x and your range a, b, and you, you essentially decompose x minus a times b minus x as the sum of four squares. And if you do that, then um, essentially because the sum of four squares is non-negative, also the left side will be non-negative, and that kind of implies directly that x is an a, b. Um, the main problem with this approach is that it requires integer commitments, so you need to prove statements and commit to integers. Um, so that usually requires trusted setup and large parameters because generally you use class groups or, or, um, or RSA groups uh, with trusted setup. So the main kind of idea of, of this work is, can we actually make this work over the, over ZP, like uh, modulus P? And um, so we just use like a generic, uh, like fairly generic uh, integer, uh, not integer commitment, but a commitment mod P. And, uh, Essentially, um, if you look at the decomposition, then we can see that um, that uh, like the first thing that we need is that x is short. If x is not short, then uh, in the decomposition, like on the on the left side, you might have overflows, and uh, or like on either side, you have overflows. And if you have overflows, then you have wraparounds, and you don't really get any information about whether or not your value was positive or not. But intuitively, if x is short, then everything is a calculation over the integers because you never reach the modulus, and uh, then you actually can. Um, yeah, then this actually implies shortness. So um, essentially that's kind of the goal. So for, for actually extracting a short value, so essentially we, we want to build a, a certain knowledge protocol um, for extracting now a short value. And for this, um, we look into like, how do you actually usually build, like how do you actually prove openings usually? So we just have like a, a standard Sigma protocol that has zero knowledge and soundness. So like we just use a very generic, uh, like the, the most common, uh, Sigma protocol for this, then we use homomorphic commitments. And then if we, if we check how to actually extract values, then we can see that actually um, the extracted value is, is, uh, is a fraction mod P. And the, the cool thing is that you can actually ensure that the denominator and denominator are short um, based on checks by the verifier. So um, yeah, so we are, we're kind of close to being short mod P. The main problem is that, that X is a fraction and a fraction mod P doesn't actually retain shortness. So we, can't, we don't actually get a guarantee yet because I mean, for example, take one half as an example, one half will actually be like almost P half and then you have very large with respect to the modulus. So um, even if your denominator denominator are short, you don't actually necessarily have a short fraction. Um, but the main idea is essentially to, to map this fraction mod P to a fraction over the integers, and then we just round it to the closest uh, to the closest integer. And uh, if you do that, then uh, actually the, the I mean because the denominator and denominator are short, uh, the fraction will also be short if you compute it over the rationals with a standard um, like a standard like a computation. Then you just round it, and it will remain short. So um, this is essentially how we can extract a short value. Now we of course need to make sure that this makes sense. And for this, um, we essentially use a like essentially what we do is relax the commitment scheme so we say that um the the commitment scheme like a standard homomorphic commitment scheme that has certain like uh, properties mod p and uh, we relax this commitment scheme so we say that 
if we have a fraction mod p committed inside the commitment, then we interpret the opening as like essentially the committer then can open this by opening to some uh, to like essentially the, the rounded fraction or the flawed fraction. Um, actually, this should be rounded. I, I kind of yeah. <laughs> It works with flooring, but but there's a plus one error, so yeah, this should be rounding. Um, and then if you if you check the properties of this relaxed commitment scheme, then you see that actually it has very nice properties. Like first of all, it's binding if set and C are short, which you can ensure in the in the opening or like in the extraction. Um, it retains uh, restricted homomorphic properties and um, it retains shortness. So essentially, we can now use this commitment scheme to just like we just plug it into a, a fairly standard. A sigma protocol for showing the decomposition, and then actually, it, it can, like you can show fairly simply that that this actually works. So, um, last uh, just a, a quick evaluation of the scheme. So, first of all, it's quite simple. It's a fairly simple sigma protocol. It has good efficiency and it has trusted setup, a transparent setup, um, depending on on the on the on the underlying commit, uh, commitment scheme that you use. But there's two kind of uh, annoying caveats. So first of all, you require large groups because you need to be small with respect to the modulus. So if you have large values, then the modulus kind of grows. And uh, I kind of mentioned this quickly, you have slightly weaker homomorphic properties. Um, so yeah, um, that's it. Thank you very much for the attention. Any questions? Okay, in which case I have one. How on earth do you build a bounded integer commitment? Sorry? How do you build a bounded integer commitment? What are the, I mean, obviously you can't tell me in detail, but what are the sort of key building blocks? So, so actually the bounded integer commitment is, is fairly simple. It's essentially this, like you just use a standard homomorphic commitment scheme and then like essentially just reinterpret the opening. And if you do that, you're still binding, you're still, um, I mean, you're like, if you, if you don't not like, essentially what you do is you just have like your standard commitment and like the blue scheme is actually already like a bounded integer commitment. Okay, you so just you just don't allow opening. openings that are too large. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of like, that's kind of like the main, the main, um, yeah, the main restriction. Like you actually need to ensure that openings are large. So if there's like, if, if there's an adversary that, that can kind of change up what's committed and like you get very large commitments, or like very much large committed messages, then it's kind of hard to to make this work. But okay. But yeah. Thank you very much. No worries. Thanks. That is showing the speaker notes. That's better. Okay, well, the next talk is on uh, towards accountability in CRS generation, and the talk will be given by Hila Dahari. Thank you. Thank you. So, hello everyone. My name is Hila Dahari, and today I will talk about towards accountability in CRS generation. This is a joint work with Prabhanjan Anans, Gilad Asharov, and Vipul Goya. Let's start. It doesn't. Okay. Press this like. Okay. Okay. 
In the common reference string model, all the parties share a trusted public string and from a known distribution. So you can think about the string for a commitment to some message. And the motivation to define such a model is for achieving cryptographic primitives that we cannot achieve in the plain model. For example, non-interactive zero knowledge for NP or malicious to round MPC. So for achieving these cryptographic primitives, in the theoretical world, the CRS model is more than enough. However, in the real world, we have two major questions. So the first question is who generates the CRS? And the second question is what happens if someone holds a trapdoor to the CRS? So these questions have been studying for a long time. And the main answer is to consider weaker notion of security. For example, instead of consider non-interactive zero knowledge to consider weakness and distinguishability. And we don't want to do it. So how does it work? Who generates the CRS in the real world? So the first answer is just a trusted party. But think about it. Do you really believe that there exist trusted parties in the real world? So I guess the answer is no, right? And the second answer is multi-party computation. So we have multi-party who generates together the CRS. And if fraction of these parties are honest, then we can trust the output. So this is not enough also. And why? We know that in some cases, even the computer can leak trapdoors. And using these trapdoors, we can recover private information. So this solution does not guarantee as well that no party actually holds a trapdoor to the CRS. So what can we do? In our setting, we consider one party called authority who generates the CRS. If this party is honest, then everything works fine. You can just buy from him CRS and use this CRS. But if the party, if this authority is malicious party, then this authority can add to the CRS some trapdoors and then can recover your private information. So if this malicious authority keeps this private information to himself, basically I cannot do anything because I cannot prove that you have something in your mind. But in a case that the malicious authority actually use, uses this private information, I want the ability to prove it, okay? So there are many ways how can we use private information. And in our talk, we focus on just an authority who gives away the private information. It could be for profit and it could be just published in the internet. And we model it by backdoor service. So if you look at the picture, we have a malicious authority who generates CRS and also set up some backdoor service. So what is this backdoor service? So in the backdoor service, we have a third party. It could be anyone, basically, that sends trans transcripts of protocol to the authority, to the backdoor service, and gets back now that the backdoor service can extract the private information from this transcript and send it to the party, okay? So in our work, we introduced the notion of accountability in CRS generation. And we studied this notion for non-interactive zero knowledge and for two-party computation. In the rest of the talk, I will focus on accountability for non-interactive zero knowledge. So what does it mean? So accountability says that if the authority is malicious and gives away the private information, then we can use the backdoor service in order to generate a proof, a publicly verifiable proof. And what is this proof? This proof is an evidence that the authority is malicious, okay? So let's see how it works. We have the authority, the authority generates the CRS and the prover uses the CRS in order to generate a NISIC and send the NISIC to the verifier. Now, for example, the verifier can go to the backdoor service, send, send to the backdoor service the NISIC proof and get back the witness, the private information of the prover. And accountability says that if we have this backdoor service, then the prover can pretend that he actually wants to buy private information, okay? And can query the backdoor service. And somehow from the obtained witnesses, 
to generate a proof, okay, that the CRS was maliciously generated. and send the proof to a judge. And this is a publicly verifiable proof. So basically anyone can verify it. And then the judge output if the CRS corrupted or honest. And the way we formalize it, we construct an extractor that can query the backdoor service. And from these queries generate. For complete the definition, we also require defamation free, which means basically that we cannot generate a proof against an honest authority. So for conclusion, I just state our results. So we introduced the notion of accountability in CRS generation for non-interactive zero knowledge and two-party computation. Under standard assumptions, we get non-interactive zero knowledge for all and that satisfy accountability. And for two-party computation, we have two results. The first is an impossibility result. So there exists a two-party functionality for which it is impossible to achieve accountability. But for large class of functionalities, we do know how to achieve accountability and that standard assumption. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Hila. Any questions? We cannot hear the question. Okay, thanks for your presentation. Nice presentation. So, do you think that we can achieve subversion zero knowledge with accountability that you mentioned? Uh, yeah. So we we have a CRS generation that satisfy accountability. We basically design the CRS generation. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned this. Uh, Bellar et al. subversion resistant NISCs. So in that case, we say that if even the CRS is generated maliciously, we achieve zero knowledge. Basically means subversion zero knowledge. So do you think that we can have this notion plus accountability? I, I don't think that I follow your question. Could you repeat? Okay, no problem. Okay, you can I take think it he's down. asking what the relation is between your notion of accountability and subversion zero knowledge. Oh, I see. So if uh, I understand correct, so uh, we want to have NISIC, but we want to also have NISIC under accountability. What, what does it mean? It means that I want a party who generates the CRS because in the real world, someone should generate it, okay? Uh, so if the CRS is actually maliciously generated, so maybe we, don't, we won't have accountability, we won't have NISIC. If this is the question. Okay. Let's thank the speaker. Well, oh, sorry. Yeah, one question. So um, the class of functions that you mentioned at the end includes OT. And I was just wondering, since OT is complete for MPC, but it seems that it is not complete with respect to accountability because there is a two PC functionality, which is not accountable. So any intuition on why that is the case, why OT is not complete? with respect to accountability? So uh, the impossibility result basically is because that if the functionality is too easy, okay, so, and you can recover the witness by yourself, then you cannot blame anyone, right? Hmm. Because maybe the authority can recover your private information because the, the functionality itself, it's too easy and it's not because of the doors in the CRS. I see, okay, thanks. No. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker.
Uh, okay, so welcome to this talk. My name is Mark Simkin, and uh, this talk I'm presenting a joint work with Niels Fleischacker called Robust Property Preserving Hash Functions for Hemming Distance and more. And um, the setting of this talk is going to be about hash functions. So why are hash functions useful? Why do we use them? Um, we have a long input, we compress it into a short digest. And if we have two short digests, we can just compare those and we can see that if they are equal, then the original data was equal. And if the digests are different, then we conclude that the original data was different. So rather than comparing the original data sets, we can just look at the digests and make statements about the original data. Um, outside, within cryptography and outside of cryptography, though, we want to often make statements that go beyond equality. We want to check a variety of different properties. So if we have password hashing, it may be okay that like one character is mistyped. We would like to know that like, hey, these two long strings that were typed in, they're still very close in some distance, or if you have biometric features like a fingerprint, then you can't expect that they are always equal. So you need something weaker than checking for just equality. And in general, in machine learning, uh, you have the same thing. You have some model, you hash, like you have a long feature vector, you compress it down to a small hash. And ideally you would like to see whether they're close for some definition of closeness. And there's a bunch of different applications that you can come up with. And this is basically what these robust property preserving hash functions do. So they did generalize the notion of collision resistance from equality to other predicates that are more general. And what we basically have is that if we evaluate a predicate on the inputs, uh, or if we evaluate a predicate on the, or like a related predicate on the hash values, then we should always get the same output. So there should not be an adversary who can find two inputs such that the predicate evaluated on the inputs and the predicate evaluated on the hashes gives you a different answer. So for instance, it could be something like Hamming distance, where the original strings close in distance or where they far apart. And there are several features that we kind of care about. So ideally we would like our hash function to be as compressing as possible. We'd like the class of predicates to be as general as possible, less assumptions, and uh, ideally also somewhat efficient, like concretely efficient beyond just poorly. Um, Okay, so what do we already know? It's been a while. Um, so in 2019, this was basically introduced by Boy, Lavin, and Vaikuna and Tanatan. And um, they presented a construction for something that is called the gap hemming predicate. So that could basically do uh, a compare. If you look at the hash values, you could tell were the original, was the original input data very, very far apart in hemming distance, or was it very close? But for anything in between kind of like far apart and very close, there, um, evaluation algorithm on the hash functions wouldn't really give you any guarantees, so it could output anything. And the hash functions achieved a con constant compression rate, so they could compress the input by a constant factor. Um, and in this work, which is also from a while ago at this point, we construct uh, basically the same primitive, but for the exact Hamming distance predicate, so there is a threshold, and we can, based on the hash values, we can check is the Hamming distance between the input strings bigger than t or smaller than t. Uh, and we have basically it's no gap, like similar to gap hemming, but without a gap. And the size of our hash function uh, outputs is basically t, which is this uh, hemming distance threshold, times the security parameter, which is reasonably close to the um, optimum, as we show in the paper. And the hash function description, though, is very long. So it's uh, if I want to hash an n bit string, it's n bit times the security parameter, just to describe the hash function that you should be using, which is massive. Um, so since then, we wrote another paper where we basically do the same thing from uh, sys, and the hash values are a little bit larger, but the hash function can be compressed just to a little seed in the random oracle model. And if you combine this work with uh, Peter Scholl uh, and his questions, then you might even get it from the discrete logarithm assumption. Okay, um, cool. So I don't have time to explain the construction, so we're going to be like, it's going to be a very rough estimate of what the construction roughly is. Um, okay, so in the first line, there's a typo. Uh, it's sets and not strings. Uh, so, okay, so you take your bit string, and now you want to produce a hash, which you can then use to do the fancy thing that I just described. So what you do is, roughly speaking, you take the bit string, and you want to check, you want later on to be able to make statements about the hemming distance. So what you first do is you transform the bit string into a set. And now rather than checking Hamming distance, we will check whether the intersection of those sets will be very large. And what we then do is we say, okay, we take those sets and we transform them into polynomials. And then we will say that uh, if the Hamming distance is very small, 
then this bit, the sets will have a very large intersection. And then the polynomials will have um, basically a lot of roots in common, roughly speaking, and kind of like they can be interpolated from a small number of points. And um, what we then do is the hash value will simply be a bunch of evaluation points of those polynomial encodings of the original bit strings. And when we want to check whether two hash values correspond to input data that is close and distance, we will basically interpolate a function, a, a rational function that depends on those two polynomials that belong to two hash values. And we will check whether interpolation is successful or not by basically doing a check at a secret point and the exponent. And maybe here to point out like a detail, ideally, like usually what you would like to do is you say, hey, I interpolate something, I pick a random point, and uh, I just check whether at that point the, the candidate polynomial and the interpolated polynomial are, are the same. And if at that point they are, then I conclude I interpolated correctly. But here the technical challenge is basically that um, the, the inputs are chosen adaptive. So you have to pick the point at which you check before, and then you pick the inputs, the hash values in the polynomial. So by changing these, like the order of how you pick things, you cannot use like a standard, a standard Schwartz simple lemma. Instead, you need to do something more intelligent in the exponent. Um, mildly more intelligent. It's not that complicated. Um, Okay, cool. Do you have questions? Hello. Uh, this may be the type of open-ended question that we just confusing, but so one assumption you have here is that it's, if you have property P between the two original strings, you want to preserve property P between the two hash strings. Not exactly. Okay. So you want you just want to so you don't on the hash values you don't check whether the hamming distance of the hash outputs is still short mm -hmm. you you compute a function mm -hmm. which outputs a bit and if that and that bit will coincide okay. with the property yeah. that you want to check that on was the my question data. yeah okay so there's a predicate p prime whatever for exactly. the hash. yeah thanks yeah. any more questions Okay, in which case, let's thank the speaker. Now we're going to hear from Daniel Nagel about Alibi, a flaw in cookie hashing based hierarchical ORAM schemes and a solution. Great, thanks for that introduction. Can everyone see the slides online and hear me fine? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so yeah, um, like Mary said, I'm presenting a flaw in cuckoo hash, hashing based hierarchical ORAM and the solution. This is a joint work with my advisor, Brett Hemingway Thought and Raphael Ostrovsky. And since it's early in the morning and I don't have a lot of time, I'm just gonna mostly be explaining what cuckoo hashing is, what ORAM is, what and give a brief overview of what hierarchical ORAM is and a brief intuition of a salute of the floor um, and probably won't have time for the solution. So starting with ORAM. Imagine you have a user who has a lot of data. They want to store their data on the cloud and they could encrypt the data, but they don't really trust the cloud service provider. Um, so ORAM is a way that they can store their data on the cloud without the service provider learning their read and write access patterns. Hierarchical ORAM is a method of doing this. So it's constructed of something called oblivious hash tables and oblivious hash tables have 
a lot of the properties we want in ORAM, but not by all of them. It has the property that any acts, if an item is accessed only once, the locations it's accessed in have no resemblance to um, the virtual the index itself. And therefore, if you only query an item once, then you're leaking no information about the item or even whether it's in the table at all. And so now you can imagine you could construct an oblivious RAM by using a hierarchy of oblivious hash tables. So basically, it's almost like in a hardware, you have a L1, L2, et cetera, cache. You have a large oblivious hash table. Whenever you access something from that oblivious hash table, you put it into um, smaller memory. You access all the things in the smaller memory. And occasionally, you have to build that smaller memory into larger oblivious hash tables. But you're always preserving the property that you're going to check these smaller tables before you check the larger tables. And so you can see that it was in the smaller table. And when you go to the larger table, you can look for something else. And so then this is preserving that property that you're only going to be looking in the oblivious hash table, for in each oblivious hash table for any particular item once. Cuckoo hashing is then a method of implementing an uh, oblivious hash table. So cuckoo hashing involves two tables, each of size epsilon n, where epsilon is a constant greater than one, n is the number of items that we want to store. And each location has capacity one. And each item can be hashed to one location in each table. And it turns out that this flexibility gives you a lot more um, options in terms of where items can be located. And the probability that these items can't all be placed in the table becomes order n to the negative one. The difficulty is that order n to the negative one is not good enough in certain applications. So in a lot of um, non-secure applications, you would just rebuild if you had your cuckoo hash table not able to store everything. But in um, the oblivious RAM applications in which this is used, for reasons I won't go into, you can't do that rebuilding because it, it leaks information. And so an alternative is that you have a stash, which is just anything that didn't make its way into the main tables is put in the stash instead. And you have to look through the entire stash. And it's been shown that if the stash is of size order log n, then the failure probability becomes negligible in n. So how can we now use this to construct an oblivious RAM? Well, we can put a stash at each level, and uh, now we have each of these levels is a good oblivious hash table as we need, and we just um, use this hierarchical technique that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is secure, but it has a bit of a problem now. Uh, we're accessing two items in the main oblivious, in the main cuckoo hash table, but we're also accessing the entirety of the stash at each level. And like I said, the, the stash is of size, say log n. And so that means now we have log n accesses at each level rather than a constant number of accesses at each level. And since there are log n levels, um, this yeah, means our performance is now log squared n physical accesses per virtual access, whereas we would want it to be just log n. So this idea was presented in by Goodrecker Al in 2012 that possibly you can just combine all of these stashes. And they showed that uh, even though that each stash should be of size order log n in order to pre prevent overflow, when you combined all of the stashes, it was also fine for them to be order log n and prevent overflow. However, this presents a small problem. So if you place all of the stashed items at the beginning, then you're going to find them before you reach that level. And so when you reach that level, you're going, instead of querying the original item, you're going to be querying um, some new nonce, because remember we wanted this property that whenever you find something, you search for something new and random because you can't search for something, you're not allowed to search for something twice. And so, um, now the two locations are still random locations. So it looks like there's not gonna be any problems, but if you look at the combined sequence of accesses, then you do have a problem. 
So let's say we look at three items which were stored in oblivious in an oblivious hash table um, and created a collision, and then one of those was placed in the stash. So now because, so yeah, the parrot, the owl, and the robin were stored in this oblivious hash table, the parrot was put into the stash. And so now the item that is queried for the parrot is gonna be resampled. And so the probability that all three of these have the same location is gonna be a lot smaller than it would normally have been. Now th that probability, if we query three things that are not in the oblivious hash table, there's, the probability that they all access the same locations is also low, but it's um, not as low. And so th these two distributions are now statistically distinguishable. So yeah, that's, that's the attack. Uh, the attack was first introduced in 2012, but found its way into a total of six papers uh, because basically people were like, oh, this is secure. Let's, let's just keep using it. Um, and including three papers in the last three years. So um, yeah, that's, and there's a little mnemonic on the left to help you remember it. It once was a table of hashes that stored extra items in stashes. It all seemed like bliss, but things went amiss when the stashes were stored in the caches. Thank you. We have time for one question. Or we possibly also have time for you to tell us just a tiny sort of hint at the solution. Yeah, so the solution is pretty straightforward. You just have to remember uh, where it originally came from. And then whenever you query, you query the original thing. Um, and then, of course, in the other ones, you query random indexes as before. Thank you very much. Cool. Our last talk is going to be our an online talk, and it's going to be on structured encryption and dynamic leakage suppression by Marilyn George. Uh, Marilyn, would you please unmute yourself and share your screen? Hello, um, can everyone see my screen and hear me? Yes, but you're not in, oh, there. Okay. All right, so I guess I'll start. Um, Hi, I'm Marilyn, uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm here to present our work on structured encryption and dynamic leakage suppression. And this is joint work with Sani Kamara and Tariq Motas. So to introduce structured encryption, structured encryption is a primitive that allows a client to upload a data structure onto an external untrusted server, and then later run queries against it and receive responses to their queries. And structured encryption not only allows for static operations such as queries, but also allows for dynamic operations, which change the underlying data structure. So adds, edits, deletes, and so on. And a common adversary model that is used for the server is a persistent adversary, which is an adversary who remains on the server for the duration of the execution and learns meaningful, useful information about the data structure and the queries and this meaningful, useful information is referred to as leakage. So now leakage has been studied in many different ways over the years, and there are many interesting questions to ask about leakage. One line of work looks at exactly how many bits are leaked or leakage quantification of different cryptographic primitives. Another line of work looks at using leakage to attack uh, schemes such as structured encryption schemes. And this line of work was started in 2012. And crucially, there is the question of, can leakage be eliminated completely? Or can we hide all information or some parts of the information that is revealed to the adversary on the server? And this is known as leakage suppression. And this is the subject of today's talk. So the question in leakage suppression, can leakage be eliminated completely? So this question has been answered for different aspects of leakage. So one of the first patterns to be talked about is the query equality pattern, or is the query QI equal to the query QJ? 
So if the scheme reveals this particular information to the adversary, we say that it leaks the query equality pattern. And it was shown in 2018 that there was a static framework that would suppress the query equality. Another pattern that was of interest is known as the volume pattern, which is how many results are returned for a query QI. And there has been work in suppressing the volume or volume hiding uh, since 2019, and there've been a lot more schemes recently. And these two patterns are interesting because they pop up in many schemes, they arrive in many places, and it's not easy to hide them without introducing a lot of inefficiency into the base scheme. So looking at query equality suppression, a first sketch idea is to use ORAM, or what is known as black box ORAM simulation. And what does this mean? This means that any general data structure is first sort of flattened out into an array and stored in an ORAM. And then any query on this data structure is converted into a bunch of ORAM reads and writes before the response is returned to the client. Now, as you can sort of see from this diagram, the solution introduces efficiency costs. So it could introduce storage overheads. It could introduce round trips. And it could also introduce some leakage depending on which data structure is being simulated. But overall, this is a general purpose technique that could be used to suppress the query equality. And there's also been work in custom-made techniques, so custom-made oblivious data structures, which are made for a particular structure like a tree, and they suppress query equality on a particular data structure. So the question arises, can we do something that is general for many different data structures while also being more efficient than black box ORAM simulation? And turns out this question was answered by the query equality suppression framework introduced in 2018. And the idea was based off of the cache-based uh, cache based suppression techniques used in square root ORAM, which was introduced by Goldreich and Ostrovsky in 96. And this suppression framework ended up taking in as input a dynamic STE scheme. So a scheme that not only supports queries, but also supports dynamic operations. And it outputs a static SDE scheme, which only supports queries, but with no query quality leakage. And so given this work, it was a natural question to ask, is it possible to create a dynamic version of this suppression framework? And this is the question that our work answers. And I just want to give a high level picture of the challenges that we had while we were trying to answer this question. So it turns out because we were also using cache-based techniques, we had to suppress operation equality or what is known as the equality across ads, deletes, uh, and edits. And also it turns out that the leakage in the dynamic setting is quite strongly correlated. So if we have volume leakage along with which operation is happening, for some distributions, it turns out that it can be correlated to the query equality. And so our compiler had to start off with a basic volume hiding scheme in order to hide some aspects of this leakage. So we have a dynamic cache-based suppression framework, which now takes in as input a dynamic volume hiding structure encryption scheme and outputs a dynamic structure encryption scheme, so which continues to support queries as well as other dynamic operations, but with no query equality leakage. So just a quick summary of efficiency numbers. The main takeaway is that we end up being more efficient than black box ORAM simulation, but with more leakage. However, comparing to a standard dynamic uh, construction, we still are far off from optimal efficiency, but we have much better leakage. So in summary, we have a new dynamic query quality suppressing framework. We apply this framework to uh, two base constructions to produce uh, three fully dynamic, almost zero leakage schemes. And we show that we are asymptotically more efficient than black box ORAM simulation. And uh, please see our paper for more details. Thank you for your time. Uh, I can't see the room. So if there are any questions. Marilyn, are there any questions? 
Okay, so you have a result which achieves almost zero leakage. Would you mm -hmm. say that is necessary for most applications or can you think of cases where a little bit of leakage would be okay? So that's a really good question because this is something that people are still trying to understand. And I think that uh, depending on the application, so depending on what data you want to store and what structure you're storing and how much the client is comfortable with leaking, there could be applications that are actually okay to leak the query quality and the volume. And in those cases, you should definitely use the more efficient structure encryption schemes. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? In which case, let's thank the speaker. Uh, that concludes this session. Thank you very much, everyone. And let's thank all of the speakers again.